What a great morning. Amen? Don't you love it when the kids are in the room? It's just very quiet right now. It's just so very, very quiet. What, what an exciting day to know that our church is alive. Isn't it wonderful? Next week, I'm beginning a new sermon series. I hope you'll invite someone to join us um, called A Better Life. Everybody wants a better life. So today I'm preaching from Paul's, uh, the story of Paul's conversion in chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Are you ready for the reading of the word? Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. He wanted to bring them back, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And a voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he replied. And the Lord said to him, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas, and when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I have heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much, much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road has sent me to you so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. A word of God for the people of God. Amen? You know, recently, uh, I had the unpleasant experience of getting an Oklahoma driver's license. (laughs) It was a painful and humiliating experience, like a marathon that lasted for four days. (laughs) Unfortunately, I made the mistake of allowing my Kentucky driver's license to expire And then, I went much too long before I went to attempt to clean up the situation. (laughs) I don't want to admit this, but I will, since you're my closest friends, that I drove illegally as your pastor for several weeks. (laughs) And I found out that if you let too much time pass before you go to get your new driver's license from another state, you have to take the written test again. And you have to take the driver's test again. 
neither of which I had taken since I was 16. I told the woman, I can pass the test. I don't need to study. And I failed it. <laughs> Took the driver's test, and I failed that one too. <laughs> apparently, apparently in Oklahoma, one hand on the wheel is not sufficient. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, why would you think you could just drive with one hand? She said, it's an automatic failure. I also discovered that if you want to get your driver's test, you have to get there at 4 a.m. in the morning because it opens at 8 and there's a long line. If you arrive at 5.30 in the morning, you can get all the way up to the front of the line to find out that all the tests have been scheduled for that day, which was my experience. I'm absolutely convinced that the whole DMV thing is really intentionally set up to reveal a person's true character. <laughs> in fact, I would recommend to the Commission on the Ministry for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ that in the future, that before a pastor is considered for a new call to a church, they should require them to spend four days at the DMV while being filmed. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so, I got there at four in the morning, and I sit down next to a man who was rather rough in appearance. And I'll be really honest, I formed an immediate impression of him that was rather negative. It was during COVID, and I thought, you know, he's going to give me COVID, he's going to steal my iPad, and so I just kind of inched away from him. And I said, okay, what do you do at four in the morning in a DMV in an old abandoned mall? Will you pray? And so I prayed. I took my iPad and worked on my sermon. But it was hard because the man, just right here with the rough appearance, was listening to something on his phone that was really irritating me. I don't know what it was. But I thought to myself, doesn't he know I'm trying to pray? Doesn't he know I'm the pastor at Harvard Avenue Christian Church and I'm writing a sermon for goodness sake? It's four in the morning. Would you just shut up? <laughs> and then he says to the woman next to him, girlfriend, wife, you know, I'm really trying hard to be a better person. I'm going to really try hard this week to be a kinder person at work. I lose my anger too much, and I have a bad temper, and I'm asking Jesus to help me. He had been listening to his pastor's sermon on his phone while we were sitting in the dark. He then began to talk to the person next to him about the content of the message. And here was your pastor sitting in the dark, realizing that he had scales over his eyes. And so I, I wrote in my iPad that morning, I, I still have it in my notes, I wrote it on my iPad, David, did it ever occur to you that you might be wrong? And I don't know why it didn't, because I've been wrong so much, just ask my wife. No, she's great. But truthfully, in, in my marriage, uh, in my friendships, as a dad, as a pastor, as a head of staff, as of a human being, I, I repeatedly make assumptions about other people based on their appearance. I frequently think my opinion is more important than another person. Frequently, I will look at other people with condescend, cond in a condescending way and frequently I'm haughty and I'm arrogant, and it never occurs to me that I'm wrong. You know, if the Apostle Paul were, were to walk in here this morning, I might have something in common with him. I, I would like to ask Paul a question. If we went back for donuts, if Paul would eat a donut, I'd say, hey, Paul, while you're chewing on that donut, i got a question for you. I'm going to be preaching on this story today when you were, you were going down to Damascus, and that's not a really good good story about you really I mean it says you were breathing threats uttering threats 
And you were on the road to Damascus. You weren't a nice guy. You were going to Jerusalem to lay hands on people and to drag them out of their homes in order to persecute them, maybe jail them, and at worst, kill them. Paul, I got a question. Did it ever occur to you that you might be wrong? I think I know what Paul would say. Paul would say, no, it didn't. I mean, I I was so convinced that I was right that I was willing to leverage violence to get a win for God. I, I was so haughty, so arrogant, so convinced of my rightness that I couldn't see anybody else's opinion but my own. And until that day, until Christ knocked me down and I saw the scales over my eyes, it never even occurred to me. You know, the Apostle Paul appears for the first time in the seventh chapter of Acts uh, around this man by the name of Stephen. Uh, Stephen was appointed to be a deacon to help with the daily distribution of food. And evidently, Stephen was a very, very charismatic individual who spoke with eloquence and beauty and power and grace. And some local synagogue leaders came out to question him And they began to belittle him. And when they could not bully him, they began to make up lies about Stephen. He wants to tear down the temple. He's tearing down our laws. This angered a crowd who began to stalk him and wanted his blood. At this point, the other religious authorities with the more stable minds intervened. And they began to question him. In this moment, rather than feeling threatened, Stephen, a man of grace and poise and eloquence, began to preach a sermon and tell them about Jesus, his great acts, his great deeds, about his resurrection. And then he made the unfortunate mistake of looking at these religious men men, and saying, did it occur to you that maybe you were wrong? My words, it's not in the text, it's David's interpretation of the text. But looks at him and says, You killed him. You killed the Son of God. Obviously, this infuriated them, made them angry. And the angrier they got, the more poised and eloquent and grace-filled Stephen became. And Stephen looked up to the skies, and this is what he said. He said, I see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father. And these religious leaders lost their poise rushed him, grabbed him, carried him to the outside of the city. They began to shout at him, pummel them, him with their fists, and stone him to death. While Saul stands there watching. Who would become Paul? Watching. Joyfully. Now, what's remarkable is that Saul, Paul, does become the most uh, important figure in our Christian faith other than Jesus. The majority of the New Testament was written by Paul. His transformation is dramatic, so dramatic his name had to be changed from Saul to Paul. After he met Jesus, he would never, ever again leverage violence for his religion. But until that moment on the road to Damascus, it just never occurred to him that he might be wrong. Here's the question this morning. Uh, if, uh, did it ever occur to you that you might be wrong? That you might be wrong about that person that you work with? Or that you might be wrong about that person that you're married to? That you might be wrong about that person that's just taking way too long getting their lid for their cup of coffee at Quick Trip? Did it ever occur to you that you might be wrong about that person who belongs to a different political party or to a different church? Did it ever occur to you that maybe your political point of view, that maybe your theology, that maybe the way you look at the world, that it might be wrong? And not only wrong, not only wrong, but because you just dig your heels in and you form judgments about others, it's not only wrong, but it's harmful. It's harmful to you And it's harmful to others. You know, the reality is that we could could 
reduce a lot of pain in our life, our relationships in the world, if we were just willing to suspend our judgment. Uh, if, if we were willing, if we were just willing to hold our beliefs loosely. If we were willing to embrace theological humility instead of doubling down on religious certainty. If we were allowed to give ourselves space to ask big questions and to be curious instead of labeling people before we listen to them. Do you know what I think we should be scared of in the world today? I mean, we, we should be scared of people who use violence to get their own way. We should be scared of mean-spirited people who, you know, use power and influence to wound and hurt others for their own point to make their way. Those people should scare us. But the scariest people in the world are those who take on the name of Jesus Christ, who are willing to use any means necessary to get a win for God because they believe God is on their side. It's religious people who lack humility and never even consider the question, Am I, could I be wrong? You know, in my opinion, this moment in time in the world we're living in, and we're seeing in our church right now, we're seeing people, new people just showing up. Why? Because I think people are looking for meaning. I think right now that we've sort of given up on institutions and we see the pain and trauma in the world. A lot of people have died over the last couple of years. And people want something significant. And so I, I see this opportunity for the church, if the church will just think in new ways and, and challenge itself and humble itself, that, that we have this opportunity not to grow the church but to reach people. You know, if the church grows, that's great, but we want to reach people to, because we're in the hope business. We're a people of the resurrection. We serve a Savior, a humble Savior who gives life to the dead. But I'm, I'm afraid that in the last 24 months, the church has missed its opportunities. Because instead of moving to the center, instead of Christians on the edges moving to the center to focus on just meeting people's basic needs and meeting them where they are, we have just, well, we've just given in to the same things that divide people as everyone else. And instead of meeting in the center, we just moved out to the edges. You know, maybe before we form a judgment about another person, uh, maybe before we arrive at a conclusion, maybe before we label someone, and before we, like, are condescending toward another person, maybe we just need to run it up to the flagpole, run it up to the flagpole and say, Hey, Jesus, here I go again. Is there anything I'm missing? Anything I need to know about this person? Would you help me? Could I be wrong here? Yeah, we've missed an opportunity. Here's the opportunity. Two people in the story. Do you know who was, when Stephen is dying, he's getting pummeled by rocks. Who's he looking at? Saul. Saul. Here he is, he's being assaulted, and Saul is watching with delight as he's dying. And what does Stephen do? He prays for him. He prays for him, and he says, Lord, don't hold it against him. And you know what's really powerful about what God does, the amazing grace of God? God answered his prayer. He answered Stephen's humble prayer and knocked Saul down and transformed his life. Then on the other side of the story, Saul's groping around, he's blind, he can't see, he's scales on his eyes, he's lost, he doesn't know what's happening. God says, hey Ananias, I want you to go find this guy named Saul, go to his house, he's praying right now, he needs you. Lord, are you sure... Have you, heard the ter- have, you, have you heard the terrible things this man has done? Yeah, I've heard. He's my chosen instrument. 
I want you to go to him. And he does. And when he goes to him, what does he do? He lays his hands on him and prays for him. Did you catch the irony of that? (laughs) Saul is on his way to Damascus to lay his hands on Ananias for harm. But Ananias lays his hands on him for healing. If we want to know what kind of church we need to be in the world, we need to be more like Stephen and Ananias. Who pray for those that we find objectionable. People of forgiveness and grace and humility. We need to be more like Ananias who uses our hands for healing and not for harm. Because you know those strong arm tactics that we sometimes want to use, you know, because we want to get our way and we align ourselves with mean-spirited people because we think they'll help us get our way. We're willing to look past their morals and values if they'll help us get our way. You know what that does? It doesn't make disciples. It just takes prisoners. Because might does not make right. It just makes enemies. Now, I could be wrong because I've been wrong a whole lot. I've been wrong a whole lot, but you know what I think? I think that Jesus needs to knock his church to its knees and make us humble and hungry. You know, the early church was not known, known as a people of a way of believing. It says in the story, the people, it describes them as the people of the way. Why were they called the people of the way? Because they were defined as by a way of living. One common confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that was their belief. And they believed lots of different things from different cultures. But they were defined by their way of living. And that way of living is what made them attractive. Not their way of believing. We make a huge mistake when our way of believing gets in the way of our way of living. You see this table? This table here, it's really simple, you know. But there's something powerful about it. You know, people just gathering around it and breaking bread together, sharing a meal together, confessing their sins to one another and praying for one another and asking and asking how can I help you how can we help one another and will you come and join us something powerful about that for me I think that's it I just think that as a church we just have to begin every day by getting on our knees remembering what's most important being humble and being hungry because otherwise, we're just going to keep getting it wrong. 